That was amazing. I say that every week, don't I? They are amazing. Let's give them another hand. <laughs> our band, our wonderful musicians, our music minister. It, you, all, you put it all together for us every week, and you make it look effortless, and I know it isn't. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, grand rising, everyone. I am uh, so glad to be back with you after a va brief vacation. I uh, had the pleasure of going to, uh, it's spelled Topsail Island, but if you're from North Carolina, you pronounce it Topsail. <laughs> Topsail. Uh, we've, my family's been going there since 1995. And it is a place where I can really come back to center, sit on the, you know, we get a little oceanfront place, on the Atlantic Ocean and um, surrounded by family and nature. And it's very peaceful. It's very peaceful. So thank you for um, allowing me to have that time for family again. As many of you know, I don't have any family in Southern California. And I grew up uh, very much surrounded by family most of my life. So it's a real treat when I can spend some time with my sister. I'll talk a little bit more. Family of origin. <laughs> family of origin. Let me, let me rephrase that because indeed you are my family and I want to say that we have an anniversary coming up. Um, on September 5th will be three years that we have been together. <laughs> yes, yes. And I, and I see this not just as my anniversary but our anniversary because that is the first day that I stood on this platform and you welcomed me so graciously and you continue to welcome me every single time I, I spend time with any of you. This is one of the most loving and accepting communities that I have ever experienced and it is my great pleasure <laughs> to be with you. Wow, we've, we've got this um, year-long theme that we're working with we're looking at this, you know, rising grandly. That's a, if you're not familiar with that, it's a Jamaican kind of Caribbean phrase that is used by people to not only say good morning, but that it is a grand rising when we meet the day each day. And so we have been rising to the occasion and we've been exploring a myriad of topics. Some of them have been easy, some of them have been a little more challenging. And today we come to September and we have five Sundays of talking about the very um, wonderful topic of peace. And uh, the month's theme is cleverly named Pieces into Peace. And uh, the, the outlines come from our um, executive director of the Science of Mind Archives, uh, Reverend Kathy, Kathy Mastriani, and of course she has the riches of the archives to draw upon, and so we'll be sharing some of that with you, some, some wonderful things from Ernest Holmes. The, the very fun thing that I see with this whole topic is, as I was looking at all the, all the, um, the outlines, you know, there's like breadcrumbs that we get to pick up and decide how we're going to walk through the theme, but it feels to me like this is a, there really is a pathway to peace a pathway to finding ourselves um, in, ingrained in and revealing and having a greater experience of peace in our life. And yet, um, sometimes we find ourselves just dealing with the day-to-day -day, uh, uh, ups and downs with life. You know, it's sometimes things seem to fall apart. And so we'll be picking up the pieces and, and walking into peace. I thought I would start with um, looking up the definition of peace. I think it's always good to start from on the same page, right? And so peace can be defined as a state in which there is no war or fighting. It can also be defined as a state of tranquility or calm. And I would go further to say that and surely, you know, I'm just repeating what we've heard before, this wisdom of that peace is not necessarily the absence of something, 
but it is truly a revelation of a state of being that lives within each one of us. And yet, if you are really invested in something that's happening in the world around you, if you're, if you're witnessing someone suffering, if you're suffering yourself, it can be hard to draw upon that peace. It can be hard to, to reach for that. It can be difficult to even find a place of peace within ourselves. But the pathway to peace really starts within. Oftentimes when we are dealing with conflict or we're dealing with turmoil, we're trying to uh, ameliorate it. Maybe we're trying to control conditions. Maybe we're trying to make sense of things. But if we move outside of ourselves first in an effort to gain or reveal a greater sense of peace, well, we've missed a really important opportunity to ground ourselves in that central place within. And, and I get it. I, I mean, I'm not much different than you. I have challenges with certain relationships. I have to tell you a little bit about my, my relationship with my sister. Um, my sister's name is Lonnie. She's my younger sister, and when you see us together, you think she's my older sister. And you think she's my older sister, she's a little taller than me, and she's a lot more bossy. <laughs> and I say that with great affection. She's a Leo from the Giddy App, and she shows up in a big way. Um, not only, you know, the thing about, and, and I know astrology is not everybody's game, but my mother was an astrologer, so I come by this understanding of the weather report that is astrology that helps us to sort of ground and center and make sense of things. And so, you know, Lonnie is this person who, not only does she um, command attention wherever she goes, but she has this huge, beautiful, open heart. And she just pours love on you. Sometimes it can be suffocating. <laughs> and, and all the while, I know who she is at the center of her being. And so growing up, you know, she was a bit of a nuisance. You know, here I was, the, the older sister, and I had this little sister that was, you know, getting all the attention and, you know, kind of commanding the room. And I found her to be a bit of a, a pain in the neck, if you will. <laughs> um, later on in our relationship, as, as uh, we grew up, I, as many of you know, I, I have, um, I come from a place of uh, addiction. And, um, and I was a real terror to my sister. So she had some complimentary <laughs> um, relationship with me where I wasn't so pleasant to be around, you know. She didn't enjoy being with me. And so at some point, you know, as we grew up and, uh, you know, she moved away and I had this Leo sister who was always wanting to connect and be together. She called me up and said, we, ne we need to spend more time together even though I live far away. And so in 1995, we spent our first week at the beach. And I brought my kids, because my husband didn't like to vacation or travel. And she brought her husband and her dog. And we had an amazing week in nature. We had an amazing week in you know, being there in the ocean, long walks on the ocean, looking for sea glass, looking for seashells, you know, relaxing in the, in, you know, the outdoors. And um, we began to explore our relationship a little more, go a little deeper in those weeks. And, you know, 28 years of consecutive weeks at the beach, we really grew to love and respect each other. And so what does this have to do with peace? I think that in this, this day that we're living in, in, in a world where we have like instant information and communication and connection through email and you know phone calls and social media that it doesn't give us time to pause and it doesn't give us time to reflect and instead we're always reacting we're always 
uh, leaning into whatever response is being called upon us. And I think response to life is important. We have this beautiful um, mantra and uh, a motto, if you will, respond with love. And I do think response is important. But I think if we want to really live in a world that is grounded in peace, it does require us to go within first. It, uh, and my sister taught me that. And I'm sure I taught her that over the years as we vacationed and we would... You know, my, I used to say the, the vacation had a rhythm of its own. We would be so happy to see each other and then there'd be some dysfunction and somebody would be crying and somebody would be screaming. And, <laughs> and then when we were, it was time to go home, we would be clinking to each other. Can't wait to see you next year. <laughs> so, and, and it was those times of turmoil and dysfunction that really taught us how to love each other in a more... Um, thorough and deep way, and so I'm really grateful for that. Um, Holmes defines peace, and I'm going to be talking about my sister and peace all month, so there's some more, more to share with you. Holmes defines peace in the Glossary of the Science of Mind text. He writes, peace, a state of inner calm, an inner calm so complete that nothing can disturb it. The peace which comes only from the knowledge that it is all. Fathomless peace is meant by the peace of spirit. This is the peace of which Jesus referred to when he said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Many of you, if you've gone to some of the other, uh, I used to hear that in a Methodist church, that peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. He goes on to write, the infinite is always at peace because there is nothing to disturb it. Okay, let's stop there. The infinite is always at peace because there's nothing to disturb it. And so we are always the infinite in expression. Every moment of every day, we are expressing the infinite. And so the, if the infinite is at peace, so can we be at peace. But it requires that we reach for it, reach inside, reach into that inner peace, that infinite that lives within us. He, he finishes up in the glossary by writing, a realization of our oneness with omnipresence give, brings peace, the peace which is accompanied by a conscious power. And so this... Beautiful. You know, if you ever really want a snippet of wisdom about a topic, go to the Glossary of the Science of Mind textbook because Holmes does an amazing job of really bringing the principles to um, greater revelation through the Glossary. And so I think that that, that idea that he, he closes with, that the peace which is accompanied by a consciousness of power. And so think about this way. You, you know, even just in a physical thing, if you're reaching for something out over here, away from yourself, you have no leverage. And so going within, we find and tap into our power. And then we go outside of ourselves. And when we look at this idea of the pathway to peace, the first stepping stone of a pathway to peace is going within. It's going within ourselves, and, it, and, it, and I know if you're like me, I have been known to be conflict avoidant. <laughs> what does that mean? That means if something's, something's off, I want to I wanna simmer it down. I want to turn the heat down. I want to make nice. I want people to feel good about themselves. I, you know, it's hard to be in conflict, but... But if we're really going to be grounded in self, in that infinite power, and be operating from a consciousness of power, we have to go within first. We can't just try to smooth out the world outside of ourselves. I, you know, I love this metaphor, this idea about how um, oftentimes when we're trying to change the world of conditions and effects, it's kind of like 
standing in front of a mirror with a hairbrush and trying to brush your hair in the mirror. <laughs> right? No, we have to start right here. Because this is the, you are the center of peace. You are the center of God. You are the center of the infinite. It centers itself in each one of us. And so we have this opportunity when we get triggered, when there are things that are happening, because you are students of this philosophy, because you come to centers like this, because you read authors and spiritual literature that remind you of this, because you take classes, because you work with affirmations, because you work with a practitioner, because you live this teaching, you have an opportunity to remember, to recall yourself, if you will, to come back to that place of inner peace first when you're triggered. Now, I'm Believe me, I've been, I mean, I've been at this a long time, and I still have those knee-jerk reactions <laughs> when things happen. Had it last two weeks ago when I was at the beach with my sister. Yeah, I can't even tell you what it was about. She wanted me to say thank you to somebody else. <laughs> and, and I, you know, I thought I had. And it was such a little thing. And yet it just, at, I have this, like, don't, tell me what to do. <laughs> like somebody could say, there is a pot of gold over there under that tree. You have to go get it. And I'd be like, don't tell me what to do. <laughs> I think it's human nature. <sighs> and so I, I really did, you know, I would wake up in the morning and I would think to myself, how can I be the most loving sister possible because that was that's important to me that relationship is important to me and I had to start with me I had to start right where I was now um, I was reading Richard Rohr I know I, I bring him bring him up here with me often on a Sunday Richard Rohr is a Franciscan monk but he's really a new thought guy. He, uh, he speaks about new thought from his own um, understanding of spirituality. And his blog was perfect for this topic because he talked about St. Francis of Assisi. And if you know anything about St. Francis of Assisi, <coughs> he, um, he really is the patron saint of animals and nature. And he really steeped himself in nature. And the reason I think it's perfect is because oftentimes when we are out in the world and we're dealing with whatever the suffering or the challenges that are around you, it's sort of like being in a house of mirrors. <laughs> like things are ping-ponging ping off of each other as we ref I reflect my concern and you reflect your concern and you know, I reflect my the things that are that are bothering me and so it's sometimes we need to remember this philosophy is very clear that the environment that you experience is a result of your consciousness. And so if we can bring ourselves back into a place of being in nature, we can have a different experience with that reflection process that is inherent to the human condition that we're all living with. And so St. Francis of Assisi reminds us of that and, um, and I love what Richard Rohr wrote um, as he was thinking about um, St. Francis and the way he spent a lot of time in hermitage with nature. Uh, Richard writes, I have been blessed to spend several Lents living as a hermit in nature. When we get rid of our devices and all the usual reference points, it is amazing how real and compelling light and darkness become. It's amazing how real animals become. It's amazing how much we notice about what's happening in a tree each day. It's almost as if we weren't seeing it all before. And we wonder if we have ever seen it at all. He goes on to say, I don't think that Western civilization realizes what a high price we pay for separating ourselves from the natural world. One of the prices is certainly a lack 
of a sort of natural contemplation and natural seeing, my times in hermitage resituated me in God's universe, in God's providence and plan. I had a feeling of being realigned with what is, and I felt like I belonged. Now, any of you who have gone on a hike, sat in your garden, perhaps sitting on the beach, some natural environment where you've been undistracted, where you've just been in that present moment, you know what he's talking about, that nature can give us that ability to be in our own minds and our own hearts and get in touch with our own soul. And St. Francis reminds us of that. I think it, um, you know, he goes on to say, nothing else makes sense when we're alone with God. All we can do is let go. There's nothing worth holding on to because there is nothing else we need. It's in the free space, I think, that realignment happens. Francis lived out of such realignment. And I think it is realignment that he announced to the world in the form of worship and adoration of God in nature. And so this idea of being in alignment, this idea of working with peace to allow ourselves to first go within before we react, before we respond, is as old as time itself. I'm getting a stare down from Dave. No? <laughs> Our media team. It's as old as time itself. Um, it really is. Um, and we live in a culture where it feels like our job is to control the natural world, to slap cement on it, <laughs> to build houses on it, to build roads on it, to put cars on it, so that we can just speed by <laughs> through our life. And so one of the assignments that I'm going to give you this week, and I'm going to give you an assignment every week, one of the assignments that I'm going to give you this week is to spend at least... 30 minutes twice this week, and if you can do it more, it's better, but 30 minutes twice this week in nature, and it could be as simple as sitting in your backyard, or it can be going up to the mountains and taking a little walk, or walking on the beach, or, or even just driving up your, your car up to the shore and being with the ocean. We have so much natural uh, opportunities to be in the natural world here in Southern California. And so I think you can do this. I don't think this assignment is too hard for you. Are you in? Yes. Yeah, excellent, excellent. And I want you to notice, notice how that grounds you. I want you to notice how it, and, and, and uh, there's one caveat, and this is a hard one for some of us. You cannot have your device in your hand. <laughs> You have to put it aside so that you can really be in touch. And don't worry, if you need something to look at, watch the waves. Watch uh, some ants on the ground. Pay attention to the, the flowers that are in front of you. Whatever the natural world is that you decide to spend 30 minutes with, it will entertain you in a beautiful way. It'll help you remember that presence. It'll help you feel your body breathing. It'll help you feel the pulse of your heart moving through your body temple. These are the, the this is one of the tools that we're going to use to center ourselves. And, and what I'm going to guarantee you is if you follow through with this assignment, when you are in the midst of something that comes up for you, something that's challenging, something that's triggering you, you can draw from this. You can bring yourselves back to this moment so that you can pause before you react or respond. Now, um, Kathy Mastrioni, 
um, has a wonderful advice that she gives us in the outline. She calls it an emergency plan when life feels like it's falling apart to transform your pieces into peace. And it's simply stop, drop, and pray. Like that? Stop, drop, and pray. The first thing we do is we stop. We stop what we're doing. We, we pause. One of, the, one of my favorite techniques sometimes is I'll, I'll be in a room and I'll just pick a random color and then I'll look through the room for that color everywhere. It'll just give me the ability to, to bring my attention back. Um, you might want to notice once you pause and bring your consciousness and your thoughts back to your own mind, you might want to notice what it is that's helping you not feel peaceful so that you can put it aside for a moment and then drop from your head to your heart space. Simply take your attention and just imagine your energy moving into your heart so that you can just breathe you might even want to put your hand on your heart when you do that so that you can go within and touch that calm that lives within you. And then finally pray in whatever way works for you. We have a really cool thing called spiritual mind treatment and affirmative prayer. You might want to try that. Um, but the idea is to really align yourself with what I like to call a thing that makes the grass grow that energy that runs through all life, that runs through you, that runs through whoever you might be in conflict with, that is everywhere present. There is no exception to the presence of God. When we don't, when we see the absence of something, there's no absence. For there is, can be no absence in the uh, realm of the infinite. Because infinite means infinite. <laughs> It means everywhere. The other tool that she offers um, when we find ourselves in a state of confusion is to um, as Ernest Holmes suggests we simply drop into that place of knowing truth. And one of those tools that I use is the Science of Mind magazine. And in the magazine there's a bunch of great articles about peace this month. And um, the author for the Daily Guides is uh, Mary Davis, and she's written Everyday Spirit, a day book of wisdom, joy, and peace. And she starts us out with a wonderful um, way to begin this month in our exploration of peace. She says, as we welcome this new month and season of the heart, let's begin with a gentle reminder Everything we need to navigate the storms of life we will find within, including peace. This week, I found myself in the middle of one of life's storms. As I rocked on the seas of change and uncertainty, I searched for the coordinates of inner peace. I remember that in the eye of a storm, there is a tranquil oasis, just like there is in us. As I looked for a path to my calm center, I noticed the small moments of beauty and gratitude unveiling my peace. I found peace in the soft pink clouds of sunrise. I found it in the joyful song of the cardinal. I found it in a deep breath, in the kindness of a friend, in meditation, in prayer, in caregiving. It was here, hiding in plain sight. She writes more, but you'll, I'll let you buy your magazine and, and, and follow along. This idea of a pathway to peace cannot start out there. One of my favorite lines of an old Bonnie Raitt song is, everybody's shouting peace on earth just as soon as we win this war. There's no war to win. There is only peace to reveal. And our opportunity this month in this pathway to peace is to start right where you are, where you, when your feet and your head are in the same place at the same time, when you can let go of attachment, when you can surrender and be in the moment and allow yourself to draw upon the inner strength that lives within you. That is how the pathway to peace starts. Thank you very much. <laughs>